House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren. Now joining me today, co-host, we've got Mr. Michael Hawley. Here you go. Hello, Al. How yeah. you doing, Al? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful, as usual. Always wonderful. That's even, great. Even when it's bad. Yeah. Um, so here we go. We're we're doing a couple of more uh, Jack the Ripper shows here. And, uh, oh yeah, and uh, old time. And um, I think I've heard of Jack the Ripper. He's <laughs> well. I'm uh, this one. This particular one I'm looking forward to. When I first started in 2009, one of the one of the people that really got me on the right track was this guy named Simon Wood. So uh, I learned so much about it, and a lot of the stuff that I would research. Uh, I would talk to a mutual friend of ours, uh, and Joe Chakuti, and he'd go, well, you know Simon found that already. I mean, you know how many times that happened. It was amazing. <laughs> so so well, I'm looking forward to this. If he really stirred you in the, st- put you in the right uh, position there, he would have told you to quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's true. It's true. <laughs> anyway, so we got Mr. Uh, Simon D. Wood uh, on the line. So how are you doing today, Simon? Good. Thank you very much. Yes, good. Fantastic. Um, okay, so now I now the book that you have out is called Deconstructing Jack, and it's the secret history of the Whitechapel murders. So before we get too detailed into what's going on, let's just lay this out for listeners because some listeners might not have any clue of what the premise of the book is. So what's the basic um, premise of this book? Well, I didn't. I when I started out, I didn't have a basic premise. I thought, well, you know, I'll just start at the beginning and work my way through it and uh, see what happens. And as I worked my way through it, I suddenly came to realize that everything that we have been told about Jack the Ripper is a lie. Wow. And it's very hard to pluck the truth out of a big lie. So... Then I, then I went back into it and I started investigating everybody and finding out how they lied, when they lied. I don't think I'll ever find out why they lied, but uh, that became the prem- that became the premise for the book. How do you how do you decide um, how you're going to do an investigation like this? Because if you're saying most of the um, uh, people involved, uh, well, I guess w- most of the people that have already explained and said to the world, this is what Jack the Ripper did and this is who he was, etc. cetera. Um, so w- where do you start from that? Do you just forget everything that's been said before and then start right at the very beginning and, and just not take into account anything? No, I'm, a- absolutely. Uh, I started at the beginning I, I ignored all the previous um, mentioned suspects. Sorry, Mike. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. And I, I just worked my way through it. I didn't ignore the, the suspects, but I just l- looked at them as they came up in chronological order. And you, you kind of see where one story begets another he gets another, and so on and so forth. And then you get the loose cannons, like um, Donald McCormick and his um, Russian policemen sent over to discredit the uh, uh, the Metropolitan Police, which just came out of the blue and it was nonsense. Uh, and then, you get, of course, the thing that started me off in 1976 was the Royal Conspiracy. And that was a doozy, completely fake, 100% fake. But by golly, it sold some books. Well, it's interesting, Simon, how you put this, because when I first started, uh, the, automatically, the automatic assumption was there was a Jack the Ripper, and that legend was the truth. And so what you did was you went a step prior to that and said, oh, let's look at this first. Yes, yeah, exactly. 
And the, the, the question I have now that, I, that I've come around to is not who was Jack the Ripper, but what was Jack the Ripper? Interesting. Because I believe it was a sort of um, umbrella term for various other crimes which were best left alone. And what, what's interesting about how you're saying this, even though if the readers are listening, one thing if you have his book, it is filled with evidence and data. He, uh, and it's like, well, that's one of the things I remember about you. You always had something with your argument when you would start. You would have something, a, a report or something with this. So that's one of the things I want to make sure everybody knows that you have, it is like pockmarked full of data and research. Yes, I, 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 I've always tried to do that, and I don't conjure things out, out of the air and then try and uh, find data to s support it because a, a lot of people a lot of people work that way and it, and it fails um, it, eventually. What I do is I, f I find the piece of data first and think, whoa, that's interesting, and then take it from there. And I watched that actually with uh, one of the people I was trying to research a long time ago was a, uh, back then the quack doctors, especially the French uh, cures doctors with the sexual, uh, um, kind of like they were experts in the sexual diseases out of Albany, New York. And so it was a, uh, a whole group. And this is where then when I was finding stuff, I noticed that you'd already done it like 10 years before me. So then I was... Then I was stealing your stuff then, okay? I'm just letting you know, Simon. <laughs> stealing it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bummer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> For me, looking at it from outside in and not being as involved as you guys, I look at this as you're, you're sort of saying, just so people understand this, that um, it wasn't so much that there wasn't murders. There was killings going on in London. But what you're saying is a lot of people that have um, told us who or what Jack the Ripper was about um, has has not been truthful up to now. So you're kind of trying to put that all right. Yes, I, I'm. I'm not saying that um, the various authors who have gone before me have, have lied. I I I just think they've misinterpreted the uh, what um, what facts there are. The people I'm accusing of lying are people like Sir Robert Anderson and Melville McNaughton and, um, you know, people, people of their ilk who are just, who, who have steered us wrong all these years. But we have to believe in their lies to come to the conclusions that we have. When, when you say steered us wrong, so let's, let's get into that some. So what do you think really happened here? Like what's, what, what's going on? So are you in essence, saying that the murders happened, but there was no just one killer. No, not no, not at all. Um, I, have, I have very different views about the, the first, uh, you know, Polly Nichols, the first canonical victim, and I have totally different views about the second one. Um, Any chapter. Uh, yeah, Chapman, Annie, Annie Chapman. And I think there's a very good case to be made, or I can't, I can't prove it, but there's a very good case for the involvement of a Conservative member of Parliament. Did you, has that been added in your book? I put it into um, the second edition. Okay. Of of, uh, of my book, and uh, I I think I think it I think it's big, I re I really do. I think there was a a personal involvement there which was embarrassing for him, um, and then you know th two weeks or three weeks uh, after her murder, he was whooshed out out of the country. Uh, yeah in America, and telling people all about it. Is he the same guy that was involved with possibly the Martha Tabram? I know one, uh, 
what was that uh, gentleman's name that had uh, gone to America and was was talking about the Martha Tabor one where he tried to go undercover and then uh, to find out who it was. So many people have done that, Mike. <laughs> they really have, and they, and they keep finding different people, different people for for, for different reasons. Michael Kidney. Right. I'm not. I'm not sure whether he he had a hand in it or not. Right. But there's some very suspicious business going on. Um, so you're thinking maybe uh, something going on, combination of Scotland Yard having connections with the members of Parliament, something to that effect, possibly. Oh, oh, absolutely. Scotland Yard was amazingly powerful at the time. Um, it was. Um, if you think of. Um, they, they were the equivalent of the uniform police, the detective police, special branch, um, the, um, oh, I forget what they call now, um, special department, mm -hmm. uh, the equivalent, they were the equivalent of the FBI. Um, they were working around the country off the books, right. sol solving this and that. And also, they were big uh, in America. Yeah, they had a lot of connections with the, the Pinkertons. I remember you were talking about that. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, the Pinkertons were really in there. And I, I, spe I spent a lot of time in, in, the, in the second edition of the book following these, following these uh, detectives around North America. Like Jarvis? Oh, yeah, it's a good old Jarvis, yes. <laughs> and Andrews. Oh, yes. Who went to, who went to Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, Shaw. Right, oh, yes. Who, who Superintendent went to... Shaw, did we find any more about that? Oh, yes. Oh. Um, he seems to have, and I, I've mentioned this already, uh, but I'll, I'll expand uh uh, I'll expand on it a bit in the uh, the next edition. He turned up calling himself, well, I think it was him, because his um, his Scotland Yard record matched the record of the person he was pretending to be. He called himself Inspector Soil. Oh, yes. S-O-Y-L-E. That's right, yeah. Uh, and it, it's an old... Funny choice of name, uh, but it's an old verb meaning to solve, <laughs> which I thought was uh, pretty pretty interesting. Um, but he gave a long interview to uh, one of the papers in, I think it was uh, Philadelphia, and he knew so much about um, the circumstances surrounding the double event and the lengths the police had gone to. And uh, he gave away more information than um, Swanson ever did. Right. Now, Swanson was basically doing Anderson's bidding. He was underneath uh, Assistant Commissioner Anderson. And then, uh, so, I mean, it seems like they were hand in hand. And uh, and you had made a comment at once, once about... Uh, when uh, one of the suspects, Kaczynski, who was actually McNaughton, was the first person that brought his name up, even though Anderson championed him, but you never saw Anderson talk about any Polish Jew until McNaughton's memorandum. Exactly. And I think the two of them got together. One said, I'll take the doctor, you take the Polish Jew, and we'll forget the third one. <laughs> Because that was the guy, Ostrog, who in October of 1894, just six months after the, um, the memoranda, was given, it was discovered that he, that he was in prison in Paris at the time mm -hmm. of the uh, Whitechapel murders, and he was given 10, 10 pounds for his trouble and false arrest. <laughs> and also... Uh, McNaughton uh, had been involved with him three years earlier in 1891. With, oh, Ostrog? Ostrog, yeah, and, and sent him off to um, a mental institute. Hmm. 
and that would have been an ideal time to uh, suspect him of uh, being the Ripper, but uh, no such luck. Hmm. So, you know, he, he, he plucked three people out, out of thin air and said, right, uh, one, two, and three. Right. These are our uh, three babies. Well, I have a, a question. I remember when you, uh, when you looked at Anderson's writings, he made a comment that early September, when uh, they were going door to door, they were convinced. It was like when he, he was not even there. Anderson was not even there yet because he was on vacation. But he said that when he got back, he was convinced, they were convinced that it was a Polish Jew. So it was almost a preconceived idea. It's almost as if McNaughton knew that, so he gave him, <laughs> gave him that name, and he, he knew that Anderson was going to take that. Absolutely. Take yeah. And I, I think that, that that whole business of the, uh, the police going door to door in, uh, in a very limited area of Whitechapel, well, it was about a, about a square mile, the whole thing, was a kind of um, unofficial census. Hmm. to see who was there and, and, and who wasn't there. So, you know, the, uh, the, the Ripper has pro pro provided endless um, excuses for uh, various odd behavior. Well, one of the things that w was intriguing to me is that here we have, uh, now we talk about the canonical five and, and, Polly Nichols being the first of the you know possible Jack the Ripper victims, but because of the previous two murders in Whitechapel, Emma Smith, the uh, you know like six months before, and then Martha Tabram, already people were talking about there was a serial kind of killer or a you know monomaniac around, and then lo and behold, this there is one, and so it almost kind of like follows what you're trying to say is you can see this prefab thing being formed. I think it was the um, it was the murder of Polly Nichols that gave birth to the idea of the, for want of a better word, serial killer uh, on the rounds, because immediately after she was murdered, the police were talking about the work of a gang. After Polly Nichols. After Polly Nichols, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, al and also yeah. Emma Smith, right? Was it? There was a work of a gang. Uh, no, Emma. Well, yes, Emma Smith. She said she was attacked by by a group of men. I've got my doubts about this. I I, I think um, she was attacked by a group of policemen. Oh boy! Well, interestingly, that it wasn't her that said it. It was that uh, that Watchman guy that said that she said that. That's right. So, and I think the thing that was used on her or in her, how horrible, um, was a truncheon. A what now? I'm sorry? A truncheon. Hmm. Perfect shape and size. Hmm. I mean, I don't know, and uh, I, I don't know whether we will ever know, but... Um, yeah. And also, you know, uh, after it happened, you know, the, all the police said, oh, don't know anything about this. And uh, Superintendent West, you know, put his best men on the case. Who oh, can't find anything about this? You know, my men would know. Yeah. And it, it, it's all very shaky. The, and then how about the, now the Mary Kelly, that was a brutal one. And then indoors. How about any perspective on that particular? Well, funnily enough, I was working on this uh, earlier today. It's a very difficult one to get around because there's, there's so many things to consider. But I don't believe anybody was murdered in huh. this. And the photograph we have of the corpse in Miller's Corp, I don't think is a photograph of a female human being. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you think it's, I mean, uh, maybe like a male human being or so? Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty nasty. It's ripped apart. Yeah, but uh, you you look at it closely. I'll, I'll, I'll have to send you some pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you look at it closely, and it's why I asked you about the wax museum that was round the corner in Whitechapel. Oh, yeah. Oh, I get you. I see that uh, that it might be something like that, that, that kind of display, because we were talking about that Whitechapel's Wax Museum. They were trying to imitate... Two sods, and then who are were experts at it, and you could couldn't tell the difference between a a human and a, one of those wax displays. Exactly. Hmm. So I'm still still working that one out at the moment. It's uh, hmm. and uh, th- this new edition of my book will be illustrated. Oh, illustrated. Oh, okay. So is this yeah. the third edition? Third edition. Yes. Okay. Because I yeah. see, uh, like, uh, is it, did you made the comment about the third edition? Because I, I thought I saw the cover. Oh, I know that you, you had the cover ready for that third edition. That's right. Yeah, I got that wonderful photograph from uh, Jose Aranto, hmm. a Spanish photographer, and I, I saw this picture, and he just posted it up on uh, Facebook for no apparent reason. I took one look at this and thought, "There's my cover," <laughs> and he was. He was charming and helpful, and um, uh, he he just said, yeah, and then he sent me a high-resolution copy of it, and uh, I sent him a copy of Volume 2, second edition, so uh, we're all happy at the moment. (laughs) Gotcha. So then again, uh, so like, so we have the Canonical Five, which we, we always talk about that, like, many people consider, because they all have a similarities in MO, like deep throat cut, uh, how would you kind of put that into play? Are, are you saying, well, I, I guess you said Mary Kelly was likely possibly not part of it, and then Elizabeth Stride, that was not even part of it either, because that was probably a domestic. So then it would be only Polly Nichols, and then uh, Annie Chapman, and uh, Catherine Eddowes, and Annie Chapman and Catherine Eddowes are the only two that kind of match each other. Okay. The extent of, the extent of mutilations and similarity right. of, uh, of mutilations, you know, all the stuff over the shoulder and... Uh, right. <laughs> I know, nasty. It is nasty. And I, I don't mention any of this in... Yeah. in in my book, so uh, you know, people don't need that. They just need to know that they died, right? And so, uh, again, just a, cl- uh, a little clarification. So, you're, the possibility that um, now, would you say, let's say, Scout and Yard possibly involved, maybe with the member of Parliament? But how about the press? I mean, they were in for money, wouldn't? I mean, you could see that there was some big money being made. Oh, they they were certainly out to. Uh, exploit it for uh, for all it was worth but I don't think they were behind the exploitation I mean none of it would have happened uh, or none of the press much of the press coverage would never have happened had the coroner Wynne Baxter milked it for all it was worth He's, he was a character oh and a crook <laughs> I don't know if I've mentioned it about his advertising agency. At the time? Yeah, he had he had one at the time. He, he was busy fleecing people. And so he was an attorney. No, or was he? Yes, he was. I beg your pardon. Yes, he was. okay. Well, yes. which means I could see him wanting that. That <laughs> that would be perfect for him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's great. But you know um, the. Um, the inquests into Polly Nichols and uh, and also Annie, Annie Chapman both stretched over two weeks. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, going by the rules, running inquests at the time, both of them should have been over in a day. Right. But he just... He introduced this cavalcade of uh, w- witnesses. So how about with, uh, now, Inspector Aberline? He's kind of famous in the world of Jack Ripper, especially like the movie From Hell. He's kind of like the man in charge on the street. 
He and then he was re he was assigned to it uh, after the Polly Nichols case. Uh, how do you, how would you put that in uh, perspective with what was going on with that? Was is that a something going on in the background there? Possibly, I I, I can't say definitively, mm -hmm. but I I look upon Abilene as a sort of ringmaster kind of in, in, enabling the whole thing. Okay. Um, but well, again... They brought, him, they brought him there. I mean, one of the... They say is because he was there before, so he knew that area quite well. But then again, also, he knew everybody. So he would have been a, he would have been a perfect person to be an enabler. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm not quite sure who sent him into Whitechapel because... Just prior, or on the same day as uh, Polly Nichols died, um, Monroe had resigned. Uh, Anderson hadn't taken over his office as yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering who sent Abilene in. So I think the the first thought I would have would be Swanson. Nah. And then I don't know. But, you know, but then, I mean, he was a chief inspector. I mean, I know that, you know, he was kind of like supposedly the the one that was supposed to be in charge, but um, but I'm curious to see uh, what would that, also to see what was going on back then. It could, yeah, you're right. It couldn't have been Anderson. No. No. And also, well, the other reason he was sent in was because Reed... And right. Arnold were both on leave. Reed was on leave at that time. Okay. Exactly. We at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. They both... Uh, um, Polly Nichols got murdered on the Friday and both their leaves started on the Sunday. And then Arnold, um, so he was the one in charge, the local there, and he was a head inspector, Reed was, yes, of this White Chapel. He was okay. your local CID man. Okay. And they both went off on holiday. So, or vacation, as you call it over here. But so they, they couldn't have thought you know, that the murder of Polly Nichols was, was of any great importance. Hmm. Mind you, it hadn't happened within H Division. It, her murder happened in J Division. That's right. Just over, just over the border. So that, that was neat. Right. And Inspector Helson, I think, was involved with that? He was. And Sprackling. What's, what's your take on the letters, the Jack the Ripper letters? I, I, I don't think any of them were written by the, the murderer. And it's interesting about the, uh, the, the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jackie postcard, which followed on, on, on the Monday. Because it, it that's the thing that ties Eddowes and Stride together. The, the letter kind of takes the blame for the forthcoming murder of Eddowes. Mm -hmm. And then the postcard ties Stride with Eddowes and makes it a double event. So when when the in the letter the author of that letter said double event this time was that the saucy jack letter or was that the um, 
the first letter, I the Dear Boss. That was the Saucy Jackie postcard. Okay. And then suddenly it was it was a, a, a double event. And so that guy was, uh, so they were wondering, I think it was Israel Schwartz, was he the one that saw somebody with uh, Elizabeth Stride? That's right. And then he, 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 he ran off home. Thinking, right. Thinking he was being chased by somebody. And then, so that might very well be who Inspector Anderson and Swanson thought was the, the person that identified the killer or something to that effect. Well, I'm rather disposed towards thinking it was um, Joseph Lowen. Okay. Who came out of the Imperial Club on the morning of Edo's murder. Right. And saw these two people standing at the end of church road, church passage, whatever it's called, which led down to Mitre Square. Okay. Um, okay. And also, uh, in 1891, they got hold of him again to try and identify Sadler as the person he'd seen. Okay. And that was with uh, the uh, Francis Cole's murder? That's correct, okay. yes. And then McNaughton said nobody saw anybody. <laughs> So. But no one's had a lot of things. <laughs> well, it's interesting because uh, maybe with McNaughton's, there was possibly a member of Parliament involved with that as well. So, well, trouble is the um, the member of Parliament went off to America and he wandered about aim aimlessly over there for for for, for no good reason then came back to Britain, then went to the Azores, and then resigned from Parliament. So he wasn't around for the double event or Mary Kelly. Hmm. He had a perfect alibi for those two. The only one he didn't have the alibi for was Annie Chapman. In the description of your book, uh, it starts out with Jack the Ripper did not exist. So yeah. what what is it that you want people to get out of the book? Like, what, is that kind of the what you hope they take away from it? And what do you mean by did not exist? Didn't, ex didn't exist as a, as, a, as a person, as a personality, uh, as, a, as a shadowy figure, was it around the East End? Um... He was, he was an invention, and a very clever one. That became a legend. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I doubt that anybody at the time thought that 140 years, whatever it is, later, we'd still be taking a deep interest in this. I think they got to about 1895 and said to themselves, nah, I think everybody's forgotten about it by now. So wh what do you think the point of that was for, like, who, I'm trying to get to the root of who who it was that, that created this um, legend, so to speak, and, and why, they did, why they created it. Definitely created by the police because uh, an, a newspaper reporter coming up with this idea is all well and good but you needed the the blessing of the police to get this put on posters outside 168 police stations so the the, the police had to believe it as as phony as it was so you're saying headquarters was the one so but the lower police probably believed what there's uh what was going on the lower police believe what they were told okay. to believe. There's a, there's a small section uh, in my book where Warren is saying something to the effect of, I, I think this uh, whole series of murders was done by a secret society. Okay. For, for, for political ends. I don't know how he came to this conclusion. And at the same time... The police in various police stations being lined up for their 
knightly duty were being read these letters supposedly from Jack the Ripper and told to, you know, look out for this chap. At the same time? At the, exactly the same time. So I was just going to let everybody know that Warren was the commissioner of the... He was the, he was the commissioner, yes. And not a very good one. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it ended after the Kelly murder anyway, didn't it? It did, yes, it did. Uh, do you think that there that there do you, did you make any connections with that with that politics that was going on between Warren and Monroe and that? Well, I I, I certainly think that Monroe was uh, working his nuts off um, yeah. trying to get rid of Warren, and uh, he eventually succeeded and took his and took his place. Okay. But um, everybody stated that Warren hadn't resigned because of Kelly's murder. Uh, he'd resigned because of this article he'd written for some magazine or other. And he'd um, sort of um, uh, he ignored the rules and, and that was thus taken to task. And then, then decided to um, resign. But it's very interesting. You look at this, was it 10 weeks of the Whitechapel murders, and it starts off with Monroe resigning, right. going over to the Home Office and running the Secret Department, and then in December, taking over as the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. There's got to be something in that. Right. And then, so Warren would not have been part of that because he was on the outs with that. So that would have been the uh, Matthews with uh, Monroe, right? That's right. Yeah, Matthews is well in with Monroe. Okay. In fact, they um, uh, Matthew. I think I think Matthews was there. Matthews, Anderson, Monroe used to have meetings once a week at, at the home office. So, mm -hmm. don't know what they were dreaming up. Well, the, I heard it was like Sunday meetings, and I thought Little Chad was involved with those meetings, some of those meetings too. Well, he, 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 may, he may well have been. It was curious that Anderson was kind of part of that uh, special branch stuff beforehand. Yes, he's part of the... Um, not for long, though. Mm. He was um, part of the anti-Fenian group of police. Um, and then that all sort of died to death. And he, he just went over to the, the Home Office and uh, was left with one contact, um, Le Caron. Right, right. Or Beach, as uh, his his proper name was. And that got him into a little bit of hot water a little later. Oh, boy, did it. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, when he suddenly blurted out in the newspapers, I don't know if anybody knew this at the time, but uh, I, I wrote the letters in the Times. And so he was responsible for sparking off the whole of the... Parnell Special Commission. And then, um, I mean, it kind of shows there there was stuff going on in the background that, uh, of course, you don't know about. And yeah. so it kind of leads to what you're talking about. There's stuff going on, and, and that's what you're trying to find out, which is so difficult. Yeah. So, and then, um, you know, with all of the um, the discrepancies in the paper, do you think that some of the um, – they were feeding some of the papers with certain information or with the deception? I think so, yes. Yes, uh, they probably were. Mm. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see the, the release of uh, all, the, all the papers from that time. Mm. But uh, that ain't going to happen. Um, I spent six months in uh, 2011 working with um, Trevor Marriott. Okay. And he was doing his darndest uh, to, to get these um, 
these papers out out into the uh, public domain. And I, I, I wrote a whole series of things for presentation to to the tribunal because they they were arguing that um, if these um, if these papers were released, uh, you know, if a sort of renegade Irishman got hold of them, he could uh, trace informers through to them to the modern day huh. and uh, take his take his revenge on them. And I, I went to a great deal of trouble to point out that this would be impossible. Right. You know, because um, certain uh, censuses don't exist anymore. They got destroyed by fire or water, and there was no census in 1941 because of Mr. Hitler. Um, and then the 1951 um, census isn't going to be available till 2051. So we'll all be pushing up daisies by that time. <laughs> right. So, you know, the, the, there's, no way, there's no way it can work. And uh, then in the middle of all this, um, did you read the Clutterbuck thesis? Uh, no, what's that? Ah, I'll send you a copy. Uh, this was um, a thesis that a guy called Clutterbuck, who was a... Uh, uh, I, th I think he was sort of special branch operative or MI5, something, something like that. I can't quite remember at the moment. But he wrote this long, long thesis, which, um, for the purposes of which he was, he was allowed access to a lot of stuff that we've never seen before. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating. So, you know, this stuff is still around, but they don't want us to see it. Right. When you were talking in your description, you talked about the additional facts, and I think it was for your second edition or your third edition. Your second, yeah. uh, uh, were, was that more the like the member of parliament, parliament stuff that you were uh, finding out lately, or is that some other stuff? No, it, it, it's other stuff that I found out. Uh, I I can't get any further with my uh, member of parliament. But, okay. Uh, you know what I have found out still stands. Right. I, I, I believe. Yeah, right. What else have we had? We, we had the, um, we had the, Royal, the Royal Conspiracy. That, that, was a, that was a good one, uh, but a complete lie. The, um, the, the, um, about the Maverick Diary is another. Oh, 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 oh. there you go. Yeah. There, there's a phony if there ever was one. And uh, these people have, have given up arguing whether it's genuine or not, huh. they're now asking about who forged it. <laughs> and there seem, it just seems to be, there's something like 8,000 posts on, on, on Casebook, and, and they're all desperately arguing with each other about this. It's such a waste of time. And then I think an, a, another very dodgy um, piece of uh, evidence is the Swanson marginalia. Okay, yeah. I think that's desperately dodgy. All the lengths they went to to convince everybody that the book he'd written the end paper notes in had been a gift from Robert Anderson because Robert Anderson loved him so much. Right. Hmm. Uh, and it, well, it wasn't. Uh, and they really had to, you know, fake it up by pasting a, a letter from Robert Anderson in the front of it and the date was all wrong. Oh, Amber Conway, is it uh, that particular one? I think that's the granddaughter of Anderson. Oh, she's the granddaughter of McNaughton. Oh, that's right. Okay. That's yeah. Right. I don't think the Andersons had any kids. Okay. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Well, I'm thinking of Swanson. This was, this was Swanson marginalia, so it was from Swanson. That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the other thing I was interesting, you made a comment about the, uh, the clocks at the time. I mean, uh, People are, are now uh, talking about certain suspects, maybe I think the cross that they uh, talk about, they're real specific, real precise in, uh, with those clocks. And your point, I think, was that, well, that's not necessarily so, so accurate. So don't take that as gospel. No, there was, um, 
I'm not sure if train time had come in yet. I must, I must, I must check that out. Because it, it was the railways who standardised time. So that a, a, a clock in Scotland read the same as a clock in London. Okay. Because before that, <laughs> they just said what they wanted to say. So uh, you had no idea what time you were going to end up in Scotland. Gotcha. But uh, you know all the um, all the all the local clocks, church clocks, brewery clocks. They just went off, you know, when when they felt like it. It, it must have been a nightmare living in Whitechapel. And I'm and I'm just interested because you'd made a comment that if if it was supporting your theory, then it was completely accurate. But if it was uh, contradictory to your theory. Then it was the other way, so you're just, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a point. It just depends on how you approach that. Exactly. Yes. Do you have any of the theories out there that people have come up with and have written about that you sort of like or think that uh, there's, it's, it, yeah, which is your sort of favorite? How's that? Well, I'm, 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 I'm not being smarmy here, but I, I like Mike's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really did. Uh, I, who else have we had? Oh my God. Do you know there's something like 370 suspects? It's amazing. It's incredible. If you had a pulse in, in Victorian London, you were a suspect. H.H. H. Holmes is now a suspect. Um, oh my God, yes. Yeah, silly, silly, silly. Um, um, uh, well, uh, you know, there's the, could Jack the Rip Ripper have been a woman? Might well have been. Uh, who, who was it? Somebody uh, put that forward. I think it was. Mary Percy was, I think, the girl, lady. Piercy. Piercy was the. Piercy, that's right. Uh, quite, quite possible. Uh, have you enjoyed any of the movies or any anybody's uh, take on it? I loved um, the one with Christopher Plummer and James Mason as Sherlock Holmes and uh, Doctor Watson. I can't remember what it was called. Oh, and speaking of that, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle nowadays is uh, a suspect too. There's a couple doctors on the East Coast that are promoting that. <laughs> so, <laughs> messing Good with way. Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, what was it called? Uh, oh, it'll 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 come to me in, in a weak moment. But I I thought that was fabulous. I I didn't like the Michael Caine thing. Mm -hmm. I thought it was nonsense, and I didn't like the Johnny Depp thing. <laughs> one he was a drunk, and the other one he was a a, a, a drug addict. Yeah, he was an addict. He, interesting man, though. No, for. Uh, I forget when it was, 1903, was it, that uh, he, he fingered George Chapman? Yes. Maybe being the Ripper. And then from that moment until 1929, he never uttered a word. <laughs> Not a word about it. And he, he, he could have made a, 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 a good living going around, you know, doing talks. Right. Uh, uh, as the man most closely associated with Jack the Ripper, but he didn't. I wonder why. I think Anderson did some talks. Oh, Anderson talk, talked about a whole lot of things. Um, <laughs> one of his one of his favourite subjects was masturbation, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> He told this story. He told this story uh, about some young man who was on a train, and uh, another passenger on the train showed him this pornographic book, and um, it just twisted the young man's mind, you know, beyond control, and he. I think he did away with himself or something like that. He or certainly went loopy. <laughs> and uh, what was it called? Um, oh, he used to belong to these um, 
Oh, D- do goody clubs. He never really, he never really talked about um, uh, Jack the Ripper, except in one of the New York papers in 1910, where he got all the facts completely wrong. <laughs> that, that was a habit that happened. Oh yeah. At the end of the day, when someone picks up your book, takes it home, and reads it, is there something you hope they take away from that book? As I said I, uh, earlier, uh, I think. If they can stop asking who was Jack the Ripper and start asking what was Jack the Ripper, I think um, that'll do them a lot of good. Right. Because you, you can't, you, even with the best intentions, you, you know, Mike, you, you've, um, <laughs> you know, with Tumblety, you could never finger him for the murders, could you? He's and he's just got worlds of stuff. This guy has been everywhere. I think that's what's so interesting about him because what he happened in not just the Ripper thing. He's just this character, so he's so fun to research. Oh, absolutely. So uh, all the stuff about yeah. Abraham Lincoln and um, who was the? Uh, oh yeah, who was the uh, Garfield? Garfield was it? Uh, yeah, and he has I mean, yeah. with that. Yeah, a little bit with uh, and then, uh, but it's like he was everywhere. So, uh, so but it's so fun, and that's that's kind of the latest research I've been doing. Where, what was going on with him in America before and after the murders? Yes. So, uh, just a character. Yeah. Do you, tell me something. Do you believe that he was six foot two and broad shouldered? And uh, no, he wasn't. What uh, I believe what he said he was. If you look in the autobiog- his autobiographies. He says how tall he is, and uh, and here's a man that would 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 definitely embellish it even more if he could, but he says exactly six foot tall, and that's from him. And it's like, well, I I would t- because he was a very deceptive individual, and then people said he was taller. What, you know, he was it was kind of like bragging rights to show how tall he was. Well, then he could have easily said six two. But he didn't. He said six foot tall exactly. Oh, really? So, yeah, six foot tall exactly. And then, uh, so, and then, remember, the, the Russian uh, Jew was five foot eleven. So, uh, so it's like, uh, you know, Ostrog was. Yeah. So, like, uh, yeah, so uh, that's one of the things. If, uh, there's a, again, we, we found a lot of new things. Like he was a hermaphrodite. Who would think of that? <laughs> Who was? I'll see. Tumbley was a hermaphrodite. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He he had uh, the uh, couple of places. Uh, one is the Undertaker talked about it. And the other was his attorney in uh, in uh, Baltimore. Tumbley passed out and his pants fell down. And he heard it, rumor that he was a hermaphrodite, and so when he came to life, he asked him about that. And Tumbley says, "Well, that uh, you know uh, has plagued me all of my life." But uh, that brings on a whole new light. <laughs> he definitely identified as a male, but he uh, that that uh, that uh, Baltimore attorney under oath was talking about the the male and female parts that Tumblety had. <laughs> so it was really weird. He had good, but that yeah. Well, he uh, he had female hip features and then uh, effeminate hands. His voice was effeminate, and then but then he had the the mustache again. His, uh, his Mustache and hair were completely white, and the Undertaker popped one of his mustaches right off. It just popped right off. So it's like this guy has a lot. So there's uh, there's some cool things coming out about with Tom. Oh, great! <laughs> I look forward to it. Simon, now do you have a website or a place that people can come find your book or find out more about you? Um. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't have a website because I, I really wouldn't know what to put on it. Uh, but you can find me at Amazon Books, uh, Deconstructing Jack. Go to Amazon, put in Deconstructing Jack. Uh, my biography is in there uh, and and various reviews. I think I've got 37 of them at the moment. Fantastic. What we'll do is we'll put that up on our website as well so people can find it um, without having to figure it out, you know, make it easy.
Well, the, again, the book we're talking about today has been Deconstructing Jack, and our guest has been the author, Simon Wood. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it, it's been great fun. Nice speaking with you, Simon. Oh, you too, Mike. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Christopher Kimball, host of Milk Street Radio. If you'd like to change the way you cook and also think about food, please check out the Milk Street podcast. We travel around the world to find pizza in Tokyo, Egyptian food in Berlin, and Bhutanese farmers in Vermont. We speak to Jamie Oliver, Rachel Ray, Al Roker, Ina Garten, as well as Michael Twitty, Marcus Samuelson, and Alice Waters. And we'll introduce you to recipes that will change the way you cook, from bright pink Tottenham cake to Afghan dumplings to show you sugar steak, and that one is direct from Hawaii. It's a whole new world of food right here on Milk Street Radio. Please check us out on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts, or go to 177milkstreet.com. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.